welcome. You probably saw the silent protest march against stop and frisk last Sunday. Well, there's now high tech pressure on the NYPD, a mobile app for bystanders to record and report all the stopping and frisking they see. We'll take a look. Also today, the post.com era. Google, Amazon, and other big players are paying plenty for new internet suffixes like .app, .books, and .movies. But is there a net gain? We'll also get the legal scoop on live TV coming to our computers. We'll see a cool underwater robot we ourselves can build. And surprise, some Americans are already making our electrical grid more efficient, and it's not who you think. First, stop and frisk. Remember the mobile internet app, I'm Getting Arrested, which connected Occupy Wall Streeters to each other and to legal help? Well, that app was designed by one of our guests, Jason Van Anden, and it inspired our other guest, Donna Lieberman, executive director of the New York Civil Liberties Union, to ask Jason to develop a stop and frisk app. What's the legal and political purpose, and how exactly will it work? Let's find out. Welcome. Hi. Hi. And we're going to show you this app in just a minute, folks. Uh, but first, Donna, explain what you have in mind here and how people are supposed to use it. Well, uh, you know, stop and frisk by the NYPD is out of control. And, and as we travel around the city, so many people have expressed to us their frustration at walking home from the station at night or, or just being out on the street and seeing young kids being thrown up against the wall or down on the ground being stopped and frisked. So, so inspired by Jason's brilliant uh, I'm Getting Arrested uh, app that came out during Occupy Wall Street, we decided to do something um, and give people something that they could do uh, when they see people getting abused by the police. So, so we developed this app for bystanders only. This is designed to document uh, what the NYP are doing, what the NYPD is doing on the streets uh, to, to New Yorkers. And of course, you don't want to interfere with law enforcement if they're commi committing an arrest uh, after a violent crime or something like that. But I guess if 700,000 people in a year are being stopped and a tiny percentage of them have ever actually done anything, then the citizens want to monitor what the police are doing. Absolutely. And we have a right to photograph the police. Uh, we don't have a right to interfere with them, um, and we have to be careful. But, but, but the public has a right to, to photograph the police, to take video pictures of the police, uh, to document what they're doing. That's part of the First Amendment. And again, to be very clear about what you just said, this is for bystanders to use. Don't try to reach for your phone or whatever device you may use an app on while a police officer is asking you to stop. So let's get that straight up front. Jason, you designed this. Yes. Um, and we have some views of it that our viewers can see at home. So why don't we just take a look at the screen together okay. and you tell us what we're seeing. Okay, well basically the, you, part of the design uh, challenge of this was to make this app as simple to use as possible so that it could be used immediately in the event that it needed to be. So there's three core, fun there's three functions, record, listen, and report. Uh, Record basically allows you to instantly start recording an incident once you see it. Uh, once you finish recording, it will take you into report mode, but you don't need to record an incident in order to actually report an incident. Okay. Uh, at, at the end of each of these, of, of triggering each of these functions, it automatically pushes the information directly to the NYCLU. So the only person or the only organization that has access to this information is the NYCLU. In other words, if I'm doing this, this is not recording on my phone to be saved on my phone and played back by me that's, later? That's right. It's not, it's not built to do that. It does cache the information on your phone until it pushes it to the NYCLU. The reason being that in case there was no internet available at the time of the incident, we wanted to make sure that we still preserve the information. Cache is a type of file, in yeah, fact, so it in just, this case. Yeah, temporary. And then it, and then it erases. And, yeah. and Donna, I imagine that's a good idea for several reasons. Uh, one, because then you at the Civil Liberties Union are the repository of this information. An individual can't be subpoenaed or whatever to show something. But also, people can't mess with it and use it for entertainment. Right? right? You don't want people on the street saying, oh, look at the video that I got of, of that dude down the block who I don't like being stopped by the cops. 
That's right. Uh, we're about trying to um, document what's going on. It's not a scientific survey uh, by any means, but it will help us get a handle on, on, on what the NYPD is up to on the streets, and it will help shine some light on, on, on what's going on without any downside for the people doing the recording um, or the people who are being frisked. Let's go to another function. You showed us record. The next one is listen. Well, the listen function, what that does is um, it, it allows, uh, what, it, what it'll do is if you opt in to broadcast your location and if other people in the vicinity have the listen function on, they will receive a push notification with that coordinate uh, when you do trigger record. In other words, this is to trigger a flash mob, in effect, or at least a few individuals to come to the scene so there are more witnesses yeah, to whatever's going mob. on. Yeah, it's definitely not a flash mob. We actually limit the number of people who can receive this, yes. and, it's, and it's picked pseudo-randomly based upon the uh, people who've opted in. Okay. So it'll never be like, it's not really meant to You don't want 20 that, people showing up. No, it's not, and it's not, it's not really built for that, no. But still, it's to summon people to be witnesses to an encounter between a police officer and a stoppy? Yes. Yeah, that, that, was, that was the purpose of yes. this. Uh, it was built originally with feedback from community groups that do monitor these types of uh, uh, incidents. And so it was built initially with them in mind. Donnie, what are you going to do with all this information? The videos, whatever else you get? Well, as soon as we catch our breath, now that the uh, silent march is over, um, we're going to start taking a look and, and, and seeing what we're getting. And it'll take a while for us to figure out what's coming in um, on this. And um, you know, there, there are a lot of different uh, uses for these. It's really, really important that, that um, uh, the public have um, an understanding of what we mean by stop and frisk. Um, the mayor always talks about how the police have an obligation to be courteous and respectful. Well, we know that that's the farthest thing from, from what goes on in most cases. Or maybe it goes um, on in most cases and not in some other well, cases. Well, I think, you know, the stories we get from young kids of color and, and, and from adults of color, too, is that it's not, excuse me, sir, um, by, by a long shot. It's up against the wall and down on the ground. And I think that, that also, um, you know, what we see often is that, that teenagers see a cop approaching them and they put their hands up. And, and my kid doesn't do that. You know, white kids don't do that. And, and I think if we see that happening over and over again, um, um, it sends a message that even the mayor and the police commissioner hopefully will understand. Right now, um, uh, the mayor and the police commissioner have recognized only that there's a lot of public uh, opposition to this practice. Um, but they have really yet to, to demonstrate that they think there's something fundamentally wrong with it. And, and that's a real problem. Let, let's go back to the app. There's one Sorry. more of the main three functions. We saw record and listen, and the third one is report. Oh, yeah. Well, I can actually do a little demo here. Uh, I'm going to trigger record, okay? And uh, so to trigger record, you can either do it by clicking the button on the phone, but you can also trigger it from your, uh, from your, from your camera button on the phone. If you need to stop the recording, you can either click it or you can shake the phone, and that'll automatically lock the phone. So at this point, the, the video is now being sent but to what the What does NYCLU. that do? It, I mean, why? Why that function? Why are you sensitive to shaking it and that would stop it? Well, in the event that, that you're suddenly stopped from recording uh, and you don't necessarily have the wherewithal to turn off the recording yourself by clicking. So at that point, if you drop the phone, it'll automatically lock the phone and it'll start sending the video to the NYCLU. When you unlock the phone, it automatically enters into the survey mode. And again, this is, all, all of this functionality is optional. All right, so now, now it'll walk you through a survey uh, that allows you to... Uh, incident report. It's asking you for locations and age and uh, gender and so forth of the person stopped. So this is about what you are witnessing as yes. a bystander. Right. Okay, and so all this information is... Questions uh, about what the officer did or did not do. Yep. I'm repeating all this because this may be a little bit small on the screen for some people to see, but they definitely get the idea. All right, and then when you submit the survey, it just it gets sent to the NYCLU at this point. So it's already off to their 
servers. There's already some police reaction to this, right? Yeah. Good, bad, neutral? You know, uh, no, they've been hostile, and they're accusing us of things that are kind of bizarre, you know, creating a database and, and stuff like that. We don't create a database. We have a Gmail account that, that, that gets the, um, uh, the videos. Um, I guess if that's a database, then my own Gmail account would be a database as well. Um, and, um, you know, I think that um, it's unfortunate that, you know, the NYPD that is so in, intent on watching everybody else gets upset when people are watching them. And um, our message is that actually this has got to be a win-win situation. You know, sunshine is, is, as they say, the best disinfectant. And it's good for the good police officers uh, who do their job well. And, and with respect for fundamental rights. And, and it's good to find out when police officers are b misbehaving because that helps us make the NYPD better. What was it like for the two of you to work together? If she was your client and you were the app designer, <laughs> was it clear what she wanted and what you thought you could do and all well, of that? Yeah, I mean, also, I live in Flatbush, Brooklyn, so I've actually seen these incidents. I've heard kids talking about these incidents and I've seen some pretty upsetting situations myself where nobody felt good, the cops, the person being stopped, the people, the bystanders that didn't know where to look. I mean, it, so, so when when the NYCLU uh, approached me about this, I was I, I I felt like this was like a, a I could really use technology to impact uh, policy in a positive way. Did you suggest stuff that she never thought of because you're? Oh, the it was definitely a collaboration. Guy. No, it was totally a collaboration. I had thought about things from uh, the experience with them getting arrested. The NYCLU had a lot of really great ideas. Their community organizers that were that they were affiliated with had some awesome input, and uh, so it was total collaboration, and it was great. Did you ask for anything he couldn't deliver because it was too expensive or something? No, I mean Jason was has been fabulous. We call him the App Meister for the movement, <laughs> and uh, it's a well-earned title. I'm sure that nobody has has raised as many concerned and been as. Uh, uh, picky as we we've been and he's agreed to work with us as as we get experience over time to refine the app so that we don't have any unintended consequences. We're, we're out of time just tell viewers how they can get this app if they want it. They can go to nyclu.org or they could find me on the street and get one of these cards nyclu.org backslash app. And, and it is for Android only at this point. For the moment it's for the droids only but we're working on uh, we He's working <laughs> on an iPhone app, and we hope to have it. Thank soon. you very much for coming in and Thanks, showing it to us. Up next, the post.com era, can domain names like .sneakers get traction? Do your part. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank today. skating with my friend. He had an extra board and then he just gave it to me and I've been skating ever since. Well, when I don't learn a trick and I have my mind set on something and I'm not getting what I want, I just keep going for it until I get it right. She didn't go to college, so she wants me to experience that whole thing, and so I could end up getting, like, a good job. Ah! I think to get into college, I'll have to be determined. Just like when I want to get a new trick, and skating's helped me realize I've got what it takes. We're used to .com, .org, and .net. But a new era is about to begin. The nonprofit that organizes the internet, called ICANN, is making available roughly 2,000 new web suffixes, including .app, .movie, .sex, and .books. In terms of marketing, this could be big, so players like Google and Amazon are spending a fortune 
to get the rights to certain suffixes. But many businesses worry that they'll be boxed out if one company gets control of, say, dot shoes or dot groceries. This is a speculative fight over theoretical territory. Fortunately, Taylor Tepper has written about the new dots for the iPad newspaper, The Daily, and can help us bring it down to earth. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. First, what is this organization, ICANN? I-C-A-N-N. -N. What yeah. do they actually do? They are in charge of creating the, and, and they say secure and, and safety, and they make sure that these domain names run smoothly. So they're the ones sort of in charge of registration for these names and for registrars to, to work with them to make these names possible. And the letters I C A N N stand for Internet... Oh, Company uh, for, for Assigned Names and Numbers. Assigned Names and Numbers. Yeah. And what's wrong with the current system? Why does somebody think .com, .net, .org, and there are some others out yeah. there already, aren't enough? They think, I can't think, that there's just too few. So they want to broaden this out. They're, they want um, brands to be in charge of their ability to reach consumers, they want um, different players involved. They just want more internet. It, it especially helps for um, international organizations and or international companies reach their audience. It, someone I talked to said, a, a trademark lawyer said that um, dot com is thought of as an American thing and this will help um, this 2000, two, about 900 of the applications were from uh, Asia and Europe. So it really helps get this into a more international field. But in the past, I guess the categories uh, the suffixes were categories, right? Yeah. Dot com is for a commercial, a for-profit yeah. website. Dot org, yeah. I'm very proud to be affiliated with, you know, some dot orgs, non-profit organizations. Yeah. Dot net, dot things that have to do with the web itself. Dot right. edu for educational institutions, cuny dot edu, all this stuff. Yeah, um, brandlayer tv. So, and dot tv, aha. Yeah. But that's kind of a trick name yeah. because the other category that's been prominent so far has been countries. So .uk, mm -hmm. uh, .fr for France. TV actually represents uh, an obscure national yeah. name, uh, but we adopted it, so it's .tv for a TV show, ha, 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 right? But that all made kind of sense. Right. Why does Nike need .nike and Microsoft need .microsoft? This is just another way to reorganize the internet. Um, and the reason that they want to do this is because it allows them to reach customers in a new way. So let's say that Brian Lair wants to move up to Poughkeepsie and he wants to buy a, a house, like a big farm, and he needs a Ford pickup truck because you're a red blood American and you love Ford. So instead of going to Ford.com and backslash pickups or search the Ford.com site for the pickups, you're just going to go to pickups.ford and then it will show you a big list of the different pickups that you can do. If you want to find Poughkeepsie Ford dealerships, you can go to Poughkeepsie.Ford if you can spell it. And, um, and that's really just, that's why companies are invested. That's why they want to do it, because it helps them control their brand and get to customers. Right. So those big corporations will get what they ask for because they can afford to do it. What about, and I think this is where the controversy comes in, the generic names. You're talking about Dot .Ford. Yeah. What about dot cars, yeah. who gets to control that? Or with Nike, what about dot shoes? Can yeah. one company pay enough money and dominate dot shoes over all the others? Yeah, um, so pretty much, just to backtrack a little bit, yeah, each applicant had to spend about $185,000 to get into the string, is what the ICANN calls it, for the domain name. Now let me just stop and digest that number for a yes. minute. Because, you know, I've registered some websites in yeah. my time and you can go to GoDaddy and you can do it for sometimes ten dollars a yeah. year. Yeah, no, this ten dollars. A hundred what? Hundred and eighty five thousand dollars. And the theory behind that was that they wanted it was actually they say it's protection for trademark companies. So they made the, the, the level very high so that people can get in and do dot Ford just to, you know, get under Ford's skin so Ford has to buy it out from them. So it made the level higher so that, you know, it's a little more substantial. And um, so, yeah, so that's, and so, so the generic ones are interesting. Things like .app, I think, is the most popular one. 13 are going after that. And basically, those people have to spend that much money to, to be able to do this. And once they get it, if, if, once they buy it, figure out who is going to control .app, then a company like Google can then rent Google.app from uh, that whoever owns that domain name. Why couldn't uh, ICANN itself control something as generic 
and central to the web as .app, and companies would just have to buy the particular domain names, you know, apple.computer.app, to plug in their particular apps. It's really just not their function. It's really not what they, they're, they're not there to, to, to do the dot app or do the dot books. They're more just to oversee and make sure everything runs smoothly. And Random House could buy dot books? Yeah. And all the other publishers would be stuck with that? Yeah. Um, basically, the way it worked out though, that is true, but the way it worked out was mostly the generics were bought by these domain name companies, like top level holding and uh, Donuts. Donuts is a funny named uh, company that got $100 million just to invest in these, um, in these different domain names. So basically, yeah, most of the generics went after them. Most, most of the generics were gone after by companies like that were just in it for the domain names, like Donuts and Top Level. So they pretty much want that so that they can control that and then rent it out to people like Amazon, rent it out to Random House you know, whoever, so they can monetize that and make money off of it. Is it retailers, though, in general, who are against this, do I understand? Businesses, a lot of businesses are against this, and the reason that they're against it is that it makes it their life much more difficult. Um, the way it was described to me was that it just, there's a lot of risk and there's a lot of reward. So the risk part, the reward part we sort of talked about, it lets them reach customers in a new way, in a more in-depth way. It's, the web is more webbier, if you want to think about that way. But with the risk is that they now have to go after these 1,400, whoever, however many domain names are finally approved by ICANN, they potentially have to go after each one of those, and Nike, let's say, and they don't, Nike doesn't want someone to own Nike.sucks. .sucks is one of the ones that may be approved. They're very much against that for obvious reasons. So it makes their life difficult. They now have to, if that's approved, in the future they're gonna have to go out and make, spend money on that. All these companies are gonna have to go off and spend money to make sure that they control their brand and it's not used to put them down and for instance if the name if the no name name is dot sucks so you mean the vaunted bureaucracy over internet names and numbers i can is sitting there they're going to only release a limited finite number of internet domain suffixes and one of them is going to be dot sucks well to to uh, one point is that these were the ones that were applied for so these are the ones that people wanted. It wasn't so much that ICANN came up with these, it's just that these are the ones that were applied for. And one of the companies, Donuts, mm -hmm. applied for dot .sucks just for this type of thing. So it, it lets, lets them make more money in this new way. What happens next? What happens next is that there's a very long and potentially costly uh, process. Starting, in, starting now in, in, the, in, in the July, there's a public comment period where people can voice complaints. I think some people will probably complain about dot sucks, but we'll see. And um, then there is months more of evaluation to make sure that these companies who went after these things can get them. The really interesting thing, though, is if two or more companies are going after the same domain name. So there's 13 going after dot app. Something is going to have to be done. So um, from what I was from my reporting, I found out that um, ICANN really just wants them to settle it amongst themselves. So come to some sort of agreement. Um, top level, you pay um, donuts X amount of money so that they can have dot app, however it works out. If an agreement can't be reached, then it goes into an auction. And some of the bigger you know, domain names are going to, someone told me that it's going to reach potentially into $10 million just to control this domain name. It's going to get emotional, this, this, this uh, expert said. Or it's going to wind up in uh, civil court all yeah, over the absolutely. place. Absolutely. We will see what, I think I just saw that domain name up at Yankee Stadium. Boston, uh, yeah. oh, never mind. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Up next, how a teeny tiny antenna could change the way we watch TV. When you throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov.
If you're watching me now on the internet, yes, you can access the show at CUNY.TV 24-7, you know that the web can do a lot of the things your TV can do. There's one way it falls short, though, live broadcast television. If you want to watch 30 Rock on your computer at the same time that it's airing on TV, you're out of luck. But a new service called Aereo, backed by media mogul Barry Diller, allows you to stream live TV to your computer, tablet, or phone. Weeks after it was rolled out here in New York, Aereo got sued by all the major local broadcast TV stations, which argue that it's stealing their copyrighted content. There's no ruling yet. Greg Sandoval is a senior writer for CNET, the tech news website, and is here now to explain why all this matters. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having Tell me. Tell us more. What exactly is Aereo? I guess the best way to look at Aereo is to think of your antenna on top of what we used to put on our houses, right? Well, that antenna now is stored at Aereo's uh, facilities in Brooklyn. And you control the antenna, and you get the over-the-air broadcasts, right, that are free to everyone, all over via the Internet. So basically, they are receiving live over-the-air television, channel 2, 4, 5, 7, etc., in New York, for example, and then feeding it via the web to your computer. Exactly. Any web-enabled device. Right. Computer, tablet, iPad, phone. right, exactly. Why are they allowed to do that? It's not sure that they are. They say every individual has the right to access over-the-air broadcasts. They've always been free. Congress wanted it to be free. All they're doing is taking those transmissions that you have every right to get to and giving it to you in a new format over the Internet. So you have a right to, now to, I'm taking the broadcaster side here, you have a right to access free over-the-air television for your own personal non-commercial use. Exactly. You can't necessarily turn around and then sell it or otherwise distribute it to other people. Ariel is saying all they're doing is they're being a conduit using this antenna and the internet. And remember, the, the courts have already decided it's okay for you as a user, as a watcher of content, to make copies of that content and access that content for your own individual use. So they're saying because of these previous, you know, the Sony Betamax decision, cable vision, they are saying they're operating within the law, absolutely. Are they making money on this? At absolutely, area? $12, they'll charge you $12. Every subscriber pays $12 a month for the access. But that's not the real play here. Aereo has the hopes of one day being, you know, whether it's being acquired, whether it's invested, but some cable company will come in and say, hey, if they're allowed to do this, we can get in there and do it too. Let's buy them. Let's access their technology. They have big views. Also, there's been talk that they want to sell movies and, and branch out into other media. Um, they're only doing this with over-the-air television stations. They're That's not right. doing this with cable. So they'll do it with Channel 2, but they won't do it with, um, with the Yes Network. Or HBO or Showtime. They're, again, they're going and they're pulling off free, legal, over-the-air broadcasts. If they were to try to take cable, if they were to try to take movies like Netflix does, you, ha you need licensing rights. Those are not free. And everybody agrees on that. Is there an upside for the broadcasters? I might think, well, fewer people are watching over-the-air TV because more people are on their computers, tablets, and phones. So if that's now one of the options, and I'm, you know, Channel 9, Channel 11, trying to sell commercials and say, look, I have this whole additional audience now that's watching you via Aero. You should be speaking Aero. for Aereo. Aero, and that's exactly what Aereo says. Say, we'll help your business. We'll make it useful again. And in a digital age, when everybody's looking to their laptops and their iPads to watch content, TV shows and movies, we'll help them get it. Get your content on there. What's their reply? Their reply is, wait a minute, wait a minute. You take our stuff, and that means everybody will take it. If Aereo is allowed to take our content and distribute it, then why can't the cable guys? Remember, the cable companies rebroadcast over-the-air broadcasts, right? ABC, CBS, NBC. They already but do. They, exactly, yeah. but they pay, and yeah. they pay big money. So the argument that the broadcasters made in court, and I think it was a very, it's a logical argument. If Aereo gets it free, how come Comcast will want it free too? 
And that makes sense to me. I think that it's a legitimate argument. So where does that stand now in terms of the court case? Well, we're waiting for the judge. She heard both arguments from both sides over two days, and we're waiting for the judge, a federal district judge, Allison Nathan, to come back with a decision whether she will hit Ariel with a preliminary injunction, which means if she does, that's it. It's game over for them. At least they will appeal, but they will be shut down. Are there some parallels in communication history, legal well, history? All, all over the place, right? The, the Hollywood uh, said, hey, you can't make a videotape. Use a videotape machine, VCR, to copy television shows, movies, whatnot. And, and they, the court said, oh, yes, people can. Uh, yes, they can, exactly. Remember, they, they compared them to the Boston Strangler, that the VCR was going to kill uh, their business. And it only it, it, it meant billions of extra dollars, more money. It was a boom. But again, it was for personal use. The people with the VCRs weren't distributing it all over the place and making their own secondary profits on it. Exactly. Um, the, the antenna, these tiny antennas, one that represents what? Every person in New York City in uh, the area offices? Why are they important from a legal standpoint? Well, that was one of the things that we thought was going to happen was that, you know, a lot of, from the broadcast side, they were skeptical about whether these antennas were really picking up everything that Aereo said. And it turns out by the end of the hearing, they do. Those little antennas do work. Nobody was contesting them. So they haven't been a big factor. The, the, she's deciding on copyright law and on public performance and it had nothing to do with the antennas. So anybody, the doubters out there, the judge heard it, both sides were heard from, the antennas are legitimate. These dime-sized antennas, they actually work. Tiny little legal sling boxes. Exactly. For the public at large. It's a great right, comparison. Well, we will see if this becomes a new way to watch television on your devices. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Up next, R2-D2 submerged. When you smoke around kids, you expose them to thousands of chemicals that are eating them alive. Cigarette smoke contains poisons like cyanide and carbon monoxide that trigger severe health problems like painful ear infections, crippling asthma, and deadly pneumonia. Cigarette smoke is linked to low birth weight and doubles the risk of sudden infant death syndrome. Cigarettes are eating you and your kids alive. Quit smoking today. For help, call 311. I'm lucky. Let me help you with that. I get to do something I love. It has nothing to do with touchdowns or titles. Everybody bring it in. I get to play a part in the life of someone just starting out. How many of you think homework is just as important as teamwork? I help keep kids in school. Good. And that's the name of the game. My name is LaDainian Thomason. I don't just wear the shirt, I live it. Give, advocate, volunteer. Live United. What do you get when you cross an underwater quest for buried treasure and the do-it-yourself spirit of the web? Our next guest has a good idea. He's the co-founder of Open Rove, an open exploration community that wants to help you release your inner Jacques Cousteau. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello from New York. Hi, thanks for having me. So uh, start us at the beginning. What is Open Rove? Yeah, so um, Open ROV is, my name is David Lang, and I'm one of the co-founders of Open ROV, and it really started uh, with a conversation. So I was having a conversation with Eric Stackpole, uh, my co-founder, and he was telling me the story of buried treasure up in the in the hills in Northern California, and I was just really captivated by his story. And he showed me this early prototype that he was building, this, this small, remotely operated vehicle. And I was just totally hooked. I was entranced by the story and, and also by the potential. Um, and I said, Eric, you know, I think this could be something bigger than just, you know, going and exploring caves. I think if we make this open source, if we share our story and we share our designs and plans on the Internet, I think we can really have something here. And, you know, a year and a half later, um, that's where we are, and it's it's really taking off. We've got you know 500 members on the site, thousands of contributors all over the world, and um, we're really excited about what it can become. Now, I think we have a video that we can bring up right now that shows a little bit of this, so our viewers can actually see it. So we're going to roll this, and uh, you sure. tell us what we're looking at here. <laughs> of 
uh, off the coast of Key Largo. Eric and I were there last week. For two weeks every year, NASA. So essentially, they're simulating uh, space missions. So they, when you have an undersea base like they have at Aquarius, it gives them the opportunity to kind of experiment with what it's like being in an extreme environment. And they brought us along to see not only how the robot worked, but how they could potentially incorporate open source technology in the future, in future missions. So this is the, this, the Paul robot here. city and cave have to do with the project? Well, the Hall City Cave was really where it started. I mean, that was, you know, it, it's, a, it's a submerged cavern near where Eric um, grew up, and he had heard this story about buried treasure. Um, and so that's really the main inspiration for the robot. So he um, built the initial robot with that Hall City Cave in mind, and it's since evolved into this, this larger open source project and it has, you know, potentially dozens, if not hundreds of uses for, um, for people all over the world. How can people who are watching right now participate? Well, that's a good question. So we have our site, openrov.com, and it's, it really is an online community. We have people from like over 30 countries who are contributing. Um, we have you know, fishermen in Thailand. We have scientists in Antarctica. We have high school teachers here in California. I mean, it's a really diverse group. And so you can go on there and, and join the community there. We're going to be launching a Kickstarter project later this week um, to distribute kits. So our, our goal is to get these ROVs out to as many people as possible and Kickstarter is the vehicle and the medium that we're choosing to do that. Technically, how does it work? Do you somehow actually cable to the internet from underwater? Well, that's the, that's the long-term plan. At this point, it's, um, it's tethered to the surface. So essentially, you see through your laptop. So you, you plug the ROV into your laptop and you can see what it sees. So it is tethered. That's correct. How in, in the video we were watching, how, mm -hmm. how deep below the surface was that? You know, that was about 65, 70 feet um, depth. And so that was, like I said, four miles off the coast of, of Key Largo. We've, desi we've been designing the, the ROV from the beginning to go to 100 meters. We haven't tested that yet. The, that dive, that 70-foot dive, was probably the deepest that we've had it yet. But we've, all of our design um, parameters have been with the goal of 100-meter depth. And is it just for curiosity for people who want to just kind of peer in on this camera that's somewhere uh, below the surface of, of the ocean? Uh, yeah, right now that's what we've what we've built. But the the goal of this is to make this that you know a hobbyist could go and explore, um, but also that it's capable of serious scientific research. So we've we've maintained this kind of payload bank on the bottom where you can add different modules. When we were at Aquarius. We added a, a science payload that tested temperature and salinity. So we have, um, you know, it was, a, it was a piece that you would mount on, on the payload on the bottom, and then the ROV was able to carry that payload. We would like to develop a robotic arm for the ROV. Um, but those are the types of things that we're leaving to the community. So that's the whole point of it being open source, is that researchers or fishermen or whoever decides that they want to, to use the ROV can actually, you know, look at the source code and, and build on and add on and then share it back with the community. And also access it from any remote computer uh, out there in the general public among people who sign up. Like, I want to see this and such now and command the camera to go roving around within its range and look in certain directions and stuff like that. Well, that's the, that's the near-term goal. So right now it's just controlled via laptop, but we have a BeagleBone on board, which is essentially a miniature Linux computer. I mean, it's really amazing how cheap and how small these computers are getting, and it's, it's on board. So you... I mean, it's, it's very conceivable that we could do that in the near future, and that's something that we're going to do, um, but not at this moment, but, but hopefully very soon. What excites you about it? What would you like to see uh, done or able to be done with this that would you know, result in some body of knowledge or something uh, that would really excite you? Yeah, so um, you know, Eric was a, used to work at NASA as an engineer, and, and my story is that really I'm just an amateur. You know, I lost my job nine months ago, a year ago, and I decided that I, I wanted to get back to making things with my hands. And I met Eric, and, we, and we've, we've started this underwater robot um, you know, project. And I think that you know, if, if we can inspire anyone to be, to be an explorer, to be a scientist, I think that that's really, really exciting. The other thing is that, 
The other thing that excites me is the is the community. Um, you know, when we started, this is you know this was really a, just a simple idea that we wanted to go out there and we wanted to explore. But we keep hearing about all these different uses, especially with teachers and classrooms. We said, you know, this would be a great project. Why don't we get our class one of these ROV kits? We'll build the kit. We'll learn about engineering, electronics. But then we'll go out and we'll take it in the pond behind the school and we'll learn about biology. So I think that, you know, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of different applications to, um, you know, in particular in the education, in the education aspect. So anything we could do to kind of engage kids and, and students and get them excited about science and engineering is, is, you know, really exciting and fulfilling to me. How cheaply were you able to design and build this? It didn't actually cost that much money, right? Well, it... It's taken a lot of time, right? So Eric and I have have a really tight budget. So we've done this. We've uh, we've done this, you know, basically out of out of our pockets. And um, because of that, we've had to be really scrappy. So the entire design, we're going to be having kits available on Kickstarter for seven hundred fifty bucks. And when you think about, you know, the commercial ROVs that are capable of of what we've produced, you know, they go for around ten thousand dollars. So it's an order of magnitude cheaper. And we're really excited about, um, you know, what kind of potential that can open up. Are you worried about the environment at all? People mucking around down there? Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, the, you know, we were just at these these coral reefs in in Key Largo, and you just see how sensitive these areas are. Um, but I also saw a number of kids. You know, we went to a different reef one day, and I saw a number of kids out there snorkeling and just pointing at fish and and being it's excited. And I think that's really important for you know for the for the health of the ocean that that people respect it. And I think that telerobotics, where people don't actually have to go to the ocean and see what's going on, where they can log in their computer and, and, and telerobotically experience the ocean, I think that holds a lot of potential. So, you know, the, the potential damage that the, um, the ROV can actually do, I think, is minimal compared to the, the immense amount of good that exposing so many more people to the ocean could do. So on some level, are you happy that you got laid off from your job so you could do this? It, it was the, you know, at the time it didn't, it didn't seem so great, but uh, it's turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me. David Lang, it looks really cool, and hopefully it can be used for scientific discovery and for education. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Brian. Up next, fixing our broken electrical system. I look up to a lot of the older heads, you know, the, the innovators, the heads of the art movements of the past. They kept it really edgy and like a lot of the Latin American muralists and Latin American artists and um, their styles were very unique and new to their time. You know, somewhat controversial, but that's who I look up to mainly. Personally, I'm very excited about going to college. It's something new and it's something different than what I'm used to. I'm definitely gonna be a little out of my element, but um, that's what makes it so exciting is that, you know, it's something fresh. Well, there's so many opportunities that I think I could miss out on if I didn't go, you know? Getting into college takes planning and vision. You know, it's just like when I take a brick wall and turn it into a canvas for my art. Paintings help me realize that I've got what it takes. Putting aside political battles over climate change, polls show that most Americans want to refashion our energy system to make it more efficient, less dependent on foreign nations, and yes, less destructive to the Earth. My next guest's new book looks at ways we might actually reach that goal. Maggie Korth Baker is science editor of the website Boing Boing and the author of Before the Lights Go Out, Conquering the Energy Crisis Before It Conquers Us. She joins us via Skype from Minneapolis. Hello from New York. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on, Brett. And I think when most people approach the energy crisis, the first thing that they go to is cars. Uh, you went to electricity. How come? I went to electricity because I started doing my research for the book and figured out pretty quickly that electricity was more important than a lot of people realized. That we spend more energy making electricity in this country than we do for any other purpose, even more than transportation. And electricity production accounts for more of our fossil fuel emissions than transportation does as well. But at the same time, it's this very quiet thing. You know, I spill gasoline on my shoes at the gas station on a fairly regular basis. But electricity is this, you know, elves that live in the wall that make your light shine. And we don't really know how that process works or what happens with it. 
So I wanted to kind of highlight something that was really important, but that people weren't paying a lot of attention to. So for example, I see that you wanted to get away from the red state, blue state kind of political divide. So as an example of that, tell us about creation care and Kansas interfaith power and light as examples of what you're striving for. Yeah, there's a great idea. It's basically your heavenly father wants you to pick up after yourself. It's this idea that, you know, if you believe in God, God probably wants you to be taking care of his creation and you have a responsibility, a moral responsibility as a believer to do that. The Kansas Interfaith Power and Light is a project that was put together by the Energy and Climate Project, or the, excuse me, the Climate and Energy Project, which is a nonprofit in Kansas. And they started looking for different ways that they could connect with people on energy and on environmental issues that came at it from those people's cultural language, so to speak. They'd done these uh, focus groups where they were talking to people about what they believed about climate and energy, and they kept running over and over into these people that thought that climate change was a big socialist plot, but who really cared about energy, who had bought a Prius and changed all their light bulbs to compact fluorescence, and who really wanted to get involved in wind power. And they wanted these things because they cared about energy. They just cared about energy for different reasons than most environmentalists do. And so the Climate and Energy Project tried to reach out using things like creation care and things like saving money and things like having kind of energy independence and DIY culture as ways to reach people who cared about energy, but cared about energy for different reasons. Why do Americans use so much electricity. We use 50% more per capita than people in Europe on average, don't we? We use 50 we use 50% 50 more energy per capita than people in Europe. That's not just electricity, that's all of our energy. And the reason is because of our systems. We have systems that control how we use energy and when we use energy and what amount of energy we use. And by those systems I mean infrastructures, and that's everything from public transportation to the way that our electrical infrastructure, the wires that connect us to power plants and back to our houses and around to power plants again, the way those things are structured and the way that they work, all of those things has an influence on how we live and on the energy we use. So for instance, if you think about public transportation, I can walk out my front door here in Minneapolis and I can get on a bus and I can go pretty much anywhere in the city that I wanna go. And because of that, I am able to get by on just one car between my husband and myself, and we don't have to drive that much during the summer because Minneapolis also has this really great bicycle infrastructure. But if I went down to Kansas City, where most of my family is from, they don't have any of those things. And telling them they should drive less is like telling them to shoot themselves in the foot. Without that second car, they can't get to their jobs, they can't get to the services they need and want, and they can't really participate fully in their communities. So you have to change these systems that shape our world before you can expect people to make the kind of individual decisions about energy that might be the important thing to point out. You have various examples of innovative solutions, and one of them is called passive houses. Can you explain that? Yeah, passive houses are a way of having a building use far less energy than the kind of houses we build today but in a way that's not about you know, hooking it up with solar power necessarily or having it tied into wind power. It's about how you build this house in a way that just uses less energy but gets you everything you want from the house. So usually with passive houses, that involves a whole lot of insulation in the walls. If you look at the wall of a passive house, they all have these great big deeply set windows and doors that almost look like little window benches on every single window. And that's because there's just so much insulation there. They're also arranged so that the windows on the house are set in such a way that they capture the most amount of heat during the winter and the least amount of heat during the summer. And the houses are set up basically so that you can maintain one comfortable temperature year round with only a tiny little bit of help. And when you do that, you can save an immense amount of energy and you can still live a normal life without having to completely change everything about it. To stay with that example, how realistic is it that something like that could be adopted in a widespread way? It's very realistic. The biggest problems are the fact that 
build because it costs about 10% more on average to build a passive house than to build the kind of houses we build today, though it will save money over time from significantly less energy use. One way that you get around that, though, is by the fact that you can save a great deal of energy and save money up front simply by not building to the very stringent passive house standards, but using those ideas to build a house that works better and saves energy. The other problem is that it takes some training to be able to know how to design a house like that, and that's not training that a lot of architects have. Right now in the US, this is something that's normally done by boutique architects for rich people, because those are the architects that have the right amount of training. But it's really one of those things where the more people that know about it, and the more architects that know how to do it, the cheaper it becomes and the easier it becomes to access. How about storing excess energy from wind and solar? Is that another frontier? Yeah, that's something that is part of, you know, when I mentioned that our electricity infrastructure affects how we can use energy and what kinds of energy we can use, that's one of the things I'm talking about. We don't have any storage on our electric grid right now, at least not enough to speak of. And that's simply a legacy of how this system has evolved over the last hundred years and the fact that it's evolved alongside of sources like coal and natural gas. It never really had to have storage before, so that the thing that we're going to need in the future to balance out the variability in wind and solar production. And it's something that we're going to need not even, even beyond wind and solar production, it's something that can help maintain the stability of our electric grid and make this resource that we're incredibly dependent upon something that we can rely on a little bit better. So how could that be done? That's something that's going to be really expensive. We have, there are batteries that exist right now, but they cost millions of dollars. And the ones that are most frequently talked about have to be shipped over from Japan. There's not anywhere in the Western Hemisphere that makes them. There are other options. There are things like compressed air energy storage that allows you to store energy by, so say you had a wind farm. You could have that wind farm hooked up to a air compressor. And at night, when the wind is really strong, but demand for electricity is very low, you could use your wind farm to power an air compressor and store compressed air in porous rock underground. And then the next day, when electricity demand is high again, you run the system backwards, and that compressed air then helps power a generator that produces electricity. So there are these different options, but they're things that are expensive, and they're things that are going to take a long time to roll out. You know, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't quite realize is that when you talk about infrastructure development and you talk about things that happen in the short term, you're really happening years. And that's something we have to take into account when we think about how we're going to change our energy systems. It's so frustratingly slow though, isn't it? Because a lot of the same things that you're talking about today, people have been talking about since as far back as probably the 1970s. But with that same caveat, it's slow, it's not scalable uh, economically yet, and so these things are going to take time, but here we still are. Yeah, it's a very slow process. It's something that is certainly getting better. It's something that's certainly getting more scalable, and it's something that we can absolutely see process, progress in, but it's slow, and there's not really a good way around that. So do you have political obstacles to moving forward on these fronts, or are they mostly technological and market-oriented? I would say the biggest problems are probably political problems and uh, social problems, legal problems, things like that. Because if you look at the technology, the technology largely exists. We can make huge changes in the way we use energy with technology that just comes off the shelf right now. But a lot of the problems come in when you start talking about the sociology of technology. You know, how we as a culture, how we as governments, how we as individuals associate with that technology that already exists. One of the big problems that I've seen is that, um, you know, you can say the store energy is in the batteries of electric cars. And you could have, you know, a thousand electric cars aggregated together digitally into being one giant battery, and you could use little, take little bits of electricity and put back little bits of electricity from each individual battery so you could help the grid function better. The problem with that is right now, 
electric batteries in your vehicle, you would void the warranty if you even tried to participate in a program like that. And most people aren't going to try to participate in that program if it means the most expensive part of their car is suddenly not covered by warranty. So you have a lot of these little problems that we're going to have to find ways to work around. And politics is definitely one of the biggies. We just have I, 30 I, seconds, I, but you seem really optimistic despite all these obstacles. Where does your optimism come from? My optimism comes from the fact that we have the technology. And it comes from the fact that I think there are things that we can do and there are problems that we can solve. I am not 100% optimistic, but I am optimistic in a limited sense. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Thank you very much. And that's it for this week's show. We roll out a new episode Wednesday nights at 7.30 or see us anytime at CUNY.TV. Coming up next week, bringing transparency to health care prices. Check out my daily radio show weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC. Tomorrow morning, comparing internet dating sites. That's on 93.9 FM and AMA 20 WNYC. Talk to you then.